This is 24-7 World Radio. Brother Eric John Phelps. Continuing on here now with regard to obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. As I previously mentioned in John chapter 20, the Lord said to his disciples, As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. If you're a born-again, Bible-believing Christian man, saved by the grace of God, sealed to the day of redemption, having an, an, an inheritance eternal, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, First Peter 1. If you're that kind of Christian, which is the only kind, you have been sent by the Son of God to do His will, which is your life. Because you're dead. You died to you. What you want to do doesn't exist anymore. It's about what he wants you to do in serving him. That's why Christ said, my meat, my meat, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. They said, Lord, Lord, you, here's some food. You eat, you need to have some meat. You're, you should be hungry. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. The devil tempts him. He says, since you're the son of God, command this stone to be made bread. Because I know you're hungry, Jesus. You've been out here for 40 days. You haven't eaten a thing. And since you're the son of God, turn this stone into bread. And Christ says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. My meat is to live by the word of God, especially as set forth in this dispensation in the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Is that your meat? When he took a band of cords and he saw all those merchants in his father's temple, in the Herodian temple, which was the temple of God, he took a band of cords and he went over there where all those merchants were buying and selling doves and sheep and lambs there in the temple so the people would have a sacrifice to offer and they're making a killing on it. And he took that band of cords and he drove them out and he overturned their tables. The money goes everywhere. It was a huge mess. And the Lord said, get out of my father's house. You've made it a den of thieves, a house of merchandise. When it should be a house of prayer for all nations. Now, wouldn't you have loved to see that day? I mean, I would have just loved to watch that. <laughs> And then they remembered it was written of him, and the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Is that you? Has the zeal of the Lord's house doing his will consumed you? As my Father sent me, so send I you. In our hymn books we sing from in our little local church, our little assembly, we sing out of a hymn book titled Great Hymns of the Faith. And it was put together by a gentleman named John W. Peterson. I have an old record of him, of, his, of the music that pl is playing. It's just beautiful. A record, that's right. 33. Even have a record player, an old record player. But this is one of the songs that's on his album here. It's beautiful. The name of it is So Send I You. The lady who wrote the world was E. Margaret Clarkson. She was born in 1915. And the man who put it to music was John W. Peterson. He was born in 1921, both of them with the Lord. 
And here are the words. So send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you to toil for me alone. So send I you to bind the bruised and broken or wandering souls to work, to weep, to wake, to bear the burdens of a world a weary. So send I you to suffer for my sake. So send I you to loneliness and longing with heart a hungering for the loved and known. Forsaking home and kindred, friend and dear one, so send I you to know my love alone. So send I you to leave your life's ambition, to die to dear desire, self-will resign, to labor long and love where men revile you. So send I you to lose your life in mine. So send I you to hearts made hard by hatred, to eyes made blind because they will not see to spend, though it be blood, to spend and spare not. So send I you to taste of Calvary. As the Father sent me, so send I you. That's why we fill up the sufferings in Christ. That's the call of the Christian. We're sent by the Son of God. And where we're to go, where he reveals us to go, to do what he wants us to do, no matter what it costs us, we go. And we do. And I can think of no other time now in world history where these kinds of men and women are needed. There's some of you men that know the Lord and you're doctors. And you know that all these cancer therapies are wrong. California, you can't treat cancer without cut, burn, and drugging. Surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. It's against the law to treat cancer any other way in California. There's some of you doctors there that must say, I cannot go along with this anymore. And if this doesn't change, I must leave this state. I know one of them. He left California, he practices in Reno. There's some of you judges that know we're under emergency powers and you haven't said a word about it. 
And the vast, Amer- vast amount of American people have no idea that we've been under emergency war powers with military jurisdiction in our courts. Military war powers since 1933 and military jurisdiction in our courts since 1938. They don't know that. And you judges know that if you talk about it, that's the end of your judgeship. Isn't that true? Well, you know what? Weren't you looking for a job before you got that one? I tell you, now is the time in American history where you Christian men better acquit yourselves as men and start telling the truth in your area of expertise because when this empire goes down, you're going with it. And so are your wives, so are your children, so are your grandchildren. They're all going to suffer and many of them die. And it's going to be your fault because you didn't do the right thing in the sphere of your influence. There's some of you cops. You know, the policies of your police department are not right. Whatever they might be. And you don't talk about it. You don't do anything about it. You know, I'd rather be around a man that said, you know what? I'm not going to go along with this crime, with these sins. And I'm going to resign not knowing to what I'll be going to when I do resign. Or I'll risk being fired for telling the truth. So they fired me. Now we have the on your resume that you were fired as a police officer. And who's going to hire you now? Well, you know what? That's up to God. That's called faith. That's called doing the right thing in faith and obedience to God, knowing that he will reward you for the good that you did somehow, some way in his time. And in the meantime, you may well suffer for it. Do you realize it's pleased God for us to suffer for righteousness sake? You know why? Because suffering is good for us. It humbles us. It makes us realize that we have no power in and of our own selves. That's why Christ said to Pilate, you would have no power against me except that we're given you from heaven. There's some of you dentists that know that you put this mercury in the mouths of these people, these amalgam fillings, and you're poisoning them. And you can't do it anymore. I'm not going to use amalgam fillings anymore. There's some of you doctors that you're not going to cut out the innards of these women anymore. You're not going to cut off the breasts. You're not going to take out their, their cervixes and, and, uh, and all that stuff. You're not going to do it anymore. You're going to show people how to prevent cancer. And how to get over it if they get it. You're going to go against the cancer inquisition. And most of the doctors that have have been driven out of this country into Mexico and other foreign countries. You're not going to do it anymore. All the professions, men in the professions need to repent. And, and believe the gospel and then do the Lord's will in first telling the truth. Please, please tell the truth. Don't believe that Jack Nicholson. You can't handle the truth. Yes, I can. Tell me. Do your duty. Tell me. I'll tell you the truth, your country's getting ready for a huge foreign invasion. We're setting you people up to be annihilated by foreign armies. That's the truth. Do you think the average American can handle that? 
I don't care. Tell us the truth. Part of doing the will of God is telling the truth. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, we read verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, one of the one of the bywords of Pennsylvania is virtue. In other words, one of the ones independence. Virtue. If there be any praise, think on these things. Do you think on the truth and what is honest? Or do you dismiss it from your mind and don't want to deal with such harsh realities? Are we children or are we responsible adults? Because you see, a responsible adult faces disaster and deals with it. Does not run from it. Prays about it. Seeks the Lord. Asks how to deal with it. And then deals with it. And the Lord says to you, as he did the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my power is perfected in your weakness. That's what we want. We want God to be glorified in our weakness, because you see, then he has to come through for us, like he wants to. And we can boast in the Lord and say, you know what, we didn't do it. He did it. Somebody said in my course this weekend, he says, how did you ever figure this out, Eric? It took a brilliant mind. I said, oh, no. <laughs> That's the last thing I am. I said, I got up early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. I prayed for two hours. And I said, Lord, please show me the truth of this matter. Show me what happened to our status. Show me what happened to this government. And the Lord, bit by bit, gave me a question to answer, to find the answer to. And then he helped me find the answer. I am a mouse in a maze lost as a goose, apart from the Spirit of God answering my prayers and leading me through the maze. And that's the way it is with you too. Are you honest? Do you tell the truth? you seek to do the right thing? Or are you part of the oppression of the American peoples? And you're going to have to face God one day whether or not you were part of that oppression. And personally, I would rather face the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you know what, Lord? I resisted it. I told the truth as best I could. I trusted you about it. I trusted you provide for the airport, the, the, the pardon me, the airport, the, uh, the airwaves here, the radio station so that I could be on to tell the truth. In many ways, suffer the loss of all things. That's okay. That's okay. I just wanted to do what you wanted me to do. And at that resurrection, at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to have a little something for me, maybe, hopefully. And so it'll be with you. The judgment seat of Christ is the place where you're going to receive your eternal reward for obeying the Lord and yielding to his spirit to, to work mightily through you. And by yielding to his spirit to live the, the biblical Christian life, because you can't do it, I can't do it. Only the spirit of God works through us to will and to do of his good pleasure, working the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, temperance, faith, and so on. And as we yield it to him, he rewards us simply for that yielding. And when we said, I cannot be a part of this anymore, I'll reward you for that.
there was a black Secret Service agent. His name was Abraham Bolden. I've spoken with him on the phone and, and exchanged emails with him. He wrote a book on the Kennedy assassination. Abraham Bolden was, is a Christian man. He's a black brother in Christ. Abraham Bolden was the first black man to be appointed to the Secret Service, and he was appointed by John F. Kennedy back in 1962, I believe. Bolden wrote a book you need to get. I forget the topic, but you can Google it and find it. Abraham Bolden warned of the plotted and planned assassination of Kennedy in Miami. He was on the president's detail. He also knew of the plan to assassinate Kennedy in Dallas, and so he warned his supervisor, whose name was James Rowley. James Rowley was a Jesuit. His brother, Francis Rowley, was a Jesuit priest. James Rowley was the head of the Secret Service at the time, and dear friend of the Jesuit Daniel Power at Georgetown University. And dear friend of Brother Knight of Malta, Cartha, Deakey, Deloach, another Knight of Malta, the third in command of the FBI. How do we know this? Because Rowley and Deloach went to Georgetown University and had a special session with Jesuit priest Daniel Power after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. You can read that in Hoover's FBI, written by Cartha Deloach. But Abraham Bolden, the black man, the Christian, said, I'm not going along with this. And he said, there's a plot to kill Kennedy in Miami and Dallas. Do you know what happened to him for that? He did the right thing. They fired him. They prosecuted him. And they sent him to federal prison and wrecked his life. That's what those white devils, that white power structure did to the black Anthony Bolden, the Christian brother, when he told the truth. And I respect him. I saw Anthony Bolden, he's... 70-something now. I think he lives in Chicago. Walking down the street in Chicago. My first response to him is to call him sir. And I respect you for what you tried to do and for what you suffered because of what you tried to do. You see, it's given to us to suffer. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe. See, it's given to us to believe. We're the elect. It's not only given to us to believe on him, but it's also given to us to suffer for his sake. And how do we suffer for his sake? When we do righteousness. Don't you think that godliness is gain? I mean, the Lord will prosper you. Psalm chapter 1. If you're a tree planted by the waters, you're going to bring forth your leaf in season. Whatever you touch, you'll prosper. But I'm telling you, there'll be times when you're going to suffer and you're not going to prosper because you stood up for righteousness' sake. And that's part of Christian manhood. That's why we are made perfect, mature in Christ by the things that we suffer for righteousness sake. As my Father sent me, so send I you. The 
the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto ye were called, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who in his, who his own self bore our, bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For we were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Listen, we suffer for righteousness' sake, just like he did. So expect it. And we do not complain about it. We rejoice that we can be sufferings for Christ. That's our lot. That's what we're here for. And to stand in the gap in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation run by the devil through his Pope of Rome and his new Knights Templars, the Society of Jesus, as they wreck everything they touch. For the greater glory of God, ad majorium de glorium, right, Jesuits? When you subject, when you subjugate every nation to the political rule of the Pope of Rome overseen by you, well, we're not going along with it. And we're going to resist it which is part of suffering for righteousness' sake until the Lord should see fit to remove us from this earth. That is the lot of the Christian man. That is your lot, my brother. This is 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Jack. I invite you to listen to my broadcast on 247worldradio.com. I preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Polish-speaking people scattered around the whole world. Furthermore, I defend the Reformation in Poland, Polish Protestants and Baptists, and Polish Reformation Bible. I also expose the counter-reformation in my homeland, led by the Jesuits and by the Roman Catholic institution. Join me every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 247worldradio.com. Tu Brat Jacek, zapraszam Was do wysłuchania mojej audycji na 247 worldradio.com. Głoszę Ewangelię Pana Jezusa Chrystusa ludziom mówiącym po polsku rozproszonym po całym świecie. Ponadto bronię reformacji w Polsce, polskich protestantów i baptystów oraz polskiej Biblii reformacyjnej. Demaskuję również kontreformację w mojej ojczyźnie kierowaną przez jezuitów i przez rzymskokatolicką instytucję. Dołącz do mnie w każdy czwartek o godzinie 17 czasu wschodnioamerykańskiego na 247worldradio.com. This is brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Bruder Nicolas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören, jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags, amerikanische Zeit, für die Deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. Ich bin hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke dinsdag om 2 uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Duitse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen en 3 uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio.
Eric John Phelps back with a broadcast today. Having impressed upon our hearts as Bible-believing Christian men of our duty to do righteousness wherever we are, no matter what we might suffer for it, there is another organization on this earth who is also sworn to absolute obedience who I should say is sworn to absolute obedience to their superior. See, it's all about obedience. The obedient men who believe the gospel versus the obedient men serving the devil and the Pope of Rome. It's obedience to evil versus obedience to good. But it's all about obedience and suffering for obeying. And that brotherhood is the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, which we should respect as we even respect the devil. The last thing I want to teach little children is that stupid song, well, if the devil doesn't like it, you can sit on and attack. No, sit on and attack. Listen, that makes children think the devil's like them, a child, rather than the God of this world, the most brilliant creature other than Jesus Christ in the universe. Totally dedicated to his will to do what he wants, to rule the world through one man he will make the Antichrist. It's all about the devil glorifying himself no matter what or at what cost to those who follow him which includes the Jesuits. Remember, over 150 Jesuits died in World War II, which the Jesuits started. We read in my book, Vatican Assassins, chapter 28, this is a chapter concerning the assassination of Abraham Lincoln that the Jesuits carried out, by, pardon me, by one Bernadine F. Wiggett, a Jesuit at Georgetown, we read, quote, Jesuits are good haters. Those who are not for them are against them and are treated correspondingly. It makes no difference whether a man is a Catholic, like John F. Kennedy, priest, <laughs> bishop, or even pope, like Pope Clement XIV. Indeed, the more influential and orthodox the opponent, the greater the obligation to be on the Jesuit side. And if he is not on the Jesuit side, so much the greater justification for hating him. Unquote. The man who said that was a German, Count Paul von Hohensbruck, 1911. He was a German noble, an ex-Jesuit, and he wrote his classic work, 14 Years a Jesuit. Here's another quote. Quote, I am so glad to meet you again, he said. You see that your friends, the Jesuits, have not killed me yet. But they would have surely done it when I passed through their most devoted city, Baltimore, had I not defeated their plans by passing incognito a few hours before they expected me. New projects of assassination are detected almost every day, accompanied with such savage circumstances that they bring to my memory the massacre of St. Bartholomew and the gunpowder plot. Remember the massacre of St. Of Bartholomew was when the Jesuits used the King of France to massacre 75,000 Protestant Huguenots in 1582. 15, 1572. And the gunpowder plot when the Jesuits designed to blow up the British Parliament in 1605. Do they teach us that in public schools here in America? Why, of course not, because you see, that would be bigotry. Teaching the truth about Romanism and the Jesuits, why, that's bigotry. You don't want to be a bigot, do you? We feel at their investigation that they came from the same masters in the art of murder, 
the Jesuits. So many plots have already been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they have all failed. When we consider that the great majority of them were in the hands of skillful Roman Catholic murderers, evidently trained by the Jesuits. Do you realize most CIA assassins are Roman Catholics? Irish or Italian? Did you know that? I had one of my students in class from New Jersey. He said that, uh, what was it? One gentleman in the CIA said to me, he said, I'd like to recruit all my people from Roman Catholic, from Roman Catholic elementary schools because all they do is fight in the recess. I know I went to one of them. And that's true. It's all about who can whip who. Who can whip who and who's kissing who or who's having sex with who? That's the Roman Catholic lifestyle. Fornication and fighting. Perfect for the CIA. The Catholics in action. Here's another quotation. Let us strive to combine the calmness of reason with the fire of enthusiasm. Let us therefore become perfect in the art of loading the proud and the powerful with chains. Let us lay to heart this maxim as the rule of all our efforts. One sole authority, that of Rome. One sole order, that of the Jesuits. And since our age does not boast of a single mind capable of aspiring to universal empire, let it be ours to aim thus high. While empty heads are dreaming, let not any opportunity escape us of observing what are men's tendencies. The better we know them, the more useful they will be as instruments in our hands. Let us, at all events, so conduct ourselves that our future glory may compensate for our present abasement. This is when the Jesuits were suppressed in 1773, from 1773 to 1914. For whether our name be destined to perish or finally to prevail over kings and nations, let it at least be synonymous with the loftiest reach of greatness and daring which the world has ever seen or will ever see. Yes, when future generations read our story and learn what we have been, let them be forced to assimilate us. Not with mankind, but with those cosmonic, cos, cosmic, 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 agencies which God only puts in motion when it is his pleasure to change the laws of the universe, unquote. You know who said that? Jesuit General Aloysius Fortis in 1825, spoken in secret council from the book, The Jesuit Conspiracy, The Secret Plan of the Order, which you can get on my website. These guys are serious. They aspire a universal empire and to control all political leaders of all nations. They're serious. Are you serious in resisting it? Do you think it's just going to go away? Do you think you say a prayer that God would intervene and stop? You think that's going to just make it all go away? It's not happening. We do pray about it, but without shoe leather, doing something about it, it's not going to happen. And don't use this lame, sinful excuse. Well, the Lord's coming. I think the Lord's coming any day now. That's a lying excuse of a coward. My Puritan Calvinistic forefathers went to the battlefields hundreds of times to fight the armies led by the Jesuits. And I'm thankful that I can say they were my Puritan forefathers. And I would have delighted to be fighting under the leadership of such men like William of Orange I, or Prince Morris, his son, or Oliver Cromwell, the great protector, or George Washington. Yes. These men are serious. 
But so is the Puritan. So is the Calvinist. So is the Bible-believing man of God. We're serious, too. And we are the ones that set them back. The Lord answering our prayers. If you do not believe this, you need to get Neil on the Puritans. One of the greatest works on the Puritans was written by a guy named Neil. You need to get another work called The Puritans in Holland, England, and America. It's a two-volume set. You get it. You read it. Without the Puritans, the Calvinistic Puritans, seeking God and praying earnestly. When, Ca when Cromwell took three days with his generals at Whitehall and said, we need to pray, the Lord is not with us in battle, and we need to see where the sin is in our life. And the Lord revealed it to him in these carnal conferences that we have with King Charles I. You read Headley's Life of Cromwell, it tells you right there. These men prayed seriously, and they went to war seriously. One of Cromwell's officers, when the attack was ready to begin, Cromwell saw him bow his head in prayer. Cromwell rode over to him, put his pistol to his head, and said, we don't pray in the battle. We pray before the battle, we pray after the battle, but we fight with all of our hearts during the battle. That's the kind of military commander I want to fight under. That's the kind of guy I could follow anywhere. And that's what a Calvinist does. The Calvinist obeys the orders of his superior no matter if it kills him. Here's another quotation. It's from an unknown author in 1872. Quote, It would be an error to suppose that the decrees of the Council of 16, 1869 to 70, which is Vatican I, stood by themselves in the history of the papacy as a sudden manifestation of Jesuit supremacy. As a sudden manifestation of Jesuit supremacy. On the contrary, in the encyclical Quanta Cura, which contains the syllabus of propositions, those are called the syllabus of errors, condemned by the papacy, the Pope declares that the condemnation of these 80 propositions forms a summary of the policy of the pontificate. And this is true as respects the conduct he has pursued since his flight to Gaeta from Republican Rome in 1848. Remember, the Pope was driven from Rome in 1848 when, when uh, the Italians rose up and resisted the political power because, you see, the French had to be withdrawn. And with no French there uh, to, to oversee the tyranny of the Pope, then the Italian Republicans rose up and they said, Death to the Pope! And they opened up the Holy Office of the Inquisition in 1849 there in Rome. And they found all sorts of horrible things. Calcium bones and ovens, kind of like Auschwitz. Men that had been walled up to die. You want to see what walled up to die is about? You need to see the movie The Pit and the Pendulum with Vincent Price. A lot of inquisitional murder, torture instruments in that movie, The Pit and the Pendulum. He says, and this is true as respects the conduct he has pursued since his flight to Gaeta from Republican Rome in 1848 and his final subordination to Jesuit direction, which appears to have been consummated at that period because Pope Pius IX wanted to have a limited government. Pius Pius IX wanted to have a constitution for Italy. The Jesuits punished him, raised up, raised up the Masons, Mazzini, to drive him from Rome. And there, when the Pope was at Gaeta, they said, listen, boy, you're not going to give any constitution to the Italian people. You're going to be an absolutist dictator. And you're going to be behind the syllabus of errors. And Pius and I said, okay, we'll do. Perhaps our readers may wish to know at a glance what the syllabus is. The syllabus consists of some 80 propositions on religion, politics, and morality. Every one of which is now to be held by devout Roman Catholics as condemned by, by an infallible authority every one of which is now to be held by devout Roman Catholics as condemned by an infallible authority, which is as binding on their consciences as are the doctrines of the Bible on the consciences of others. The syllabus treats the papal authority as supreme. 
that no country may be deceived and no sovereign be left ignorant, here given in full detail is the declared judgment of him who is the sovereign ruler of millions of minds. You know, the Pope of Rome. One. Now listen carefully. One. To his rule and laws, all, na all the nations of the world must bow. That means the Pope has the right to rule your country, sir. He claims the right to rule your government. Do you think the right Pope has the right to rule your government? Two, all sovereigns hold their thrones. All people pay their allegiance on condition that they believe the creed of Rome and practice its worship. Realize John F. Kennedy <laughs> was not really a Roman Catholic. He didn't believe in the temporal power of the Pope. John F. Kennedy wouldn't allow Francis Cardinal Spellman to say Mass in the White House. And it's so because of this, they removed him on November 22nd, 1963. With certain Jesuits involved like Clay Shaw, David Ferry, Guy Bannister, and others. Three, there is no religion but that of Rome, and no other faith is to be held or allowed. Liberty of conscience is prohibited. You believe that, Roman Catholic? You think liberty of conscience is a sin? Specifically, when it comes to reading the Bible? Toleration of other religions is a crime against society, namely toleration of Protestantism and Baptist beliefs and reading of the Bible. That's the crime against society. They couldn't care less, really, about Islam, Hinduism, or Buddhism. Just so long as it's not those damnable, accursed, Bible-believing, Bible-reading heretics and obstinate heretics at that. These people got to go. Because we can't intimidate them. So the only thing we can do is kill them. Ah, I know what we'll do. We'll kill them through the cancer inquisition. That's what we'll do. We'll cut them and we'll burn them and we'll drug them. And we'll kill millions of Protestants and Baptists in so doing. All the while, they thinking they're getting legitimate medical treatment. <laughs> oh. Number four, all sovereigns who are Protestants are heretics. Realize George Washington was a heretic. That James Madison was a heretic, a Baptist heretic. That Zachary Taylor was a heretic. That Abraham Lincoln was a heretic because he joined the Protestant church a few weeks before he was murdered. Presbyterian church in Washington. Do you know that uh, James Garfield was a heretic? He could write Latin with one hand and Greek with the other at the same time. Do you realize that William McKinley was a disciple of Christ? Uh, he was a heretic. Do you realize Woodrow Wilson was a heretic? Presbyterian. Do you realize that uh, Warren G. Harding was a heretic? Do you realize FDR was a heretic? Episcopalian heretic? All these Protestant and Baptist presidents murdered by the Jesuits. And do you realize John F. Kennedy was a usurper because he departed from Holy Mother Church? All sovereigns who are Protestants are heretics, and heresy is a crime for which they ought to be deposed. All of them were deposed by assassination. And that's one of the purposes for the Secret Service. To kill a condemned president and make sure nobody suffers for it except a patsy. Got to have a patsy. Five, all free thought and free speech on religion are criminal. What I am doing on this broadcast, pursuant to the syllabus of errors, which is the doctrine of Vatican I that's on the books today, 
what I am doing today is criminal pursuant to canon law. Liberty of the press and of worship are to be put down. That means the writing of my book, Vatican Assassins, blaming Francis Cardinal Spellman on the murder of John F. Kennedy. That's, I did that under my glorious Baptist Calvinist First Amendment, written by a Baptist Calvinist. And the, and the First Amendment was called the Baptist First Amendment. That's history. That's fact. You bigot. And the reason why we have freedom of speech is because of the Protestant Reformation and the influence of the Baptists believing in separation of an organized church from an organized government. A Baptist distinctive, thank God, that was in what we made part of our, our organic document, the glorious Presbyterian Protestant Constitution, which Rome condemned as a document of Satan. This is the creed. And where it has the power, the practice of Rome. And it has the power now in this country. They have the power. Protestants have no power. Baptists have no power. It's the Roman Jesuit order controlling the Roman hierarchy in this country that has the power. Who do you think controls the Republican and the Democratic parties? The American Roman hierarchy, obedient to the Pope, overseen by the Jesuits. Who do you think controls the Federal Reserve Bank? The American Roman hierarchy, specifically the Archbishop of New York, over the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Who do you think controls the Commander-in-Chief and the Secretary of Treasury? Why, the Archbishop of New York City, overseen by the Jesuits of Fordham. That's why you don't have any lawful money. That's why you don't pay a bill. That's why you don't own anything. Take my course, I'll prove it to you. For only 1750 bucks, I'll give you more of an education than you ever had in four years in university. I'll give it to you in three days. And the tens of thousands you spent at your university, you'll wish you never spent after you take my course. You have to unlearn a whole bunch of lies and learn one glorious truth that the Pope runs the United States under the Trading with the Enemy Act since March 9th, 1933, and that is the fact of the matter. This is the creed. And where it has the power, the practice of Rome. This is indeed the practice of Rome. It is impossible to conceive of a document more deeply fraught with the essence of despotism, unquote. Who wrote this? We see at that time there were, there were men back in the 1870s who knew the truth, but they were afraid to put their name to a document that they would write like this because they were afraid of assassination. And so the author of this is unnamed. It's written in 1872. It concerns the encyclical and syllabus of 1864. It was made part of Vatican I in 1870. The year the Jesuits were expelled from Rome. The Jesuits were expelled from Rome from, in 1872. They would stay out of Rome until 1893. For 21 years, they were not allowed in Rome until Kaiser Wilhelm II and enabled them to come back. Shows you who Wilhelm worked for. Where do we find this quote? A glimpse of the Great Secret Society. It's one of the books that I've copied. You can get it on my website. Get it. Read it. A glimpse of the Great Secret Society. Have you had enough of this? Have you had enough of being reduced to poverty, penury, sickness and disease, sorrow, toil, unrequited toil, depression? Have you had enough? Well, guess what? There's good news. The eternal Son of God came down to this place 
and became a man. And he grew up to do his father's will. Savior was dying, Calvary's hill. His intent and purpose was to obey his father, which thereby, by virtue of his intent and purpose, in conjunction with his status, made him the perfect substitute, whereby God could chasten him, judge him, kill him, so that he wouldn't have to kill us. And after Christ died for our sins, he was really buried. And he rose from the dead. And he's coming back, my friend. And so the good news is you can have a free pardon of sin today. I don't care what you've done, who you are, who you're related to. The Lord Jesus Christ can save you. He can save the, the guttermost to the uttermost. Save me. <laughs> he can save you. How about it? Father, we pray in Jesus' name that those listening would truly repent of their sins and believe the gospel. This wonderful grace of God, good news. That Christ died for their sins according to the scripture, was buried and rose again. And upon so doing, that thou will do as thou hast promised and save them by thy grace. Seal them to the day of redemption and give them a home with thee in the new Jerusalem forever. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you next Monday, Lord willing. No, next Wednesday, a week from today, I'll be away. Until then, Maranatha.